it didn't work every night that scene at all like <laughs> sometimes people would it was a really good barometer of like how mature the audience was <laughs> Hi, I'm Jazz. I'm the Programme Director of Troubadour Stageworks and this is an interview which is going to be part of the Bardic Gateway, which is a new networking platform for emerging theatre makers established by Troubadour Stageworks, which is going to provide a knowledge sharing resource for people hoping to get into the creative industries, something that can tell you what you wish you'd known before you'd gone into it and where to start now. So today I'm going to be speaking to Julia. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julia. I'm an actor and advisor. I've worked on three devised show, fully devised shows. Um, at the moment, I'm working on a show called Move Fast and Break Things at the Arts Depot, which is about big data and Facebook content moderation. So first thing I want to ask is what initially interested you in devising kind of above other theatre? Was it one of the first things you went into or was it something that you sought out? Um, I think I was quite interested in it because I, I quite like writing and theatre making. It just felt like a way of being more involved and more creative than purely acting. And I first got into it because I, I was at uni and um, there was a show and they'd come up with the title of it before anything else. So which was Lights Over Tesco Car Park and I was like that's an amazing title I have to audition um, and it was a device show so so Jack the director had come up with this title just because he thought it sounded brilliant and so we sort of made a show around the title a great title which is definitely one way of making a show <laughs> um, so yeah so initially a kind of like jazzy title and also a desire to just have more of a creative stake in the in the work I was a part of. So what did um, Lights Over Tesco Car Park turn into in the end? What did it end up being about? So it ended up being about um, many things. Well, it was a kind of about alien abduction stories. Um, I had lots of audience participation. So we kind of like abducted audience members from the crowd and acted out historical alien abductions with them and it was kind of um well I don't know if we'll ever do it again but it was kind of like also a semi-documentary about this guy who'd who'd seen an alien oh not uh yeah he'd seen an alien um so yeah so it was kind of about belief and about connection and um yeah about it was kind of about theatre in some ways so when you were first approaching devising a show, obviously it was then as an actor, what was your experience of it from that side of things? So I think it, I had a really good experience the first time because so Jack Bradfield, who is the artistic director of Poltergeist Theatre, and they did Lights Over, well, we did Lights Over Tesco car park together, and they've since devised another show called Art Heist, um, which I wasn't a part of, but was great. And um, he's very good at, he's very good at leading a devising um, process. I do think you need to have a director who's like right for it, who wants to kind of, who is like has a gentle way of leading it and guiding the process, but is also really open to ideas um, and a kind of, in some ways, a democracy of creativity. Um, but yeah, I had a great, I had a really great experience. I felt very much like I was, I was very, very invested and we were all, yeah, so invested in it, we'd sort of spend hours and hours just like thinking about the show and what it could be and like making our brains hurt and then playing games and kind of finding exciting things. So it was a really like playful and fun process. I think particularly for that show because of like the content matter was quite fun. What was the first time you kind of started devising your own work or led the de devising more? Um, so... I did a show at uni and that was more kind of devised like movement work. So it wasn't exactly like, um, it wasn't exactly like a fully devised show. It was kind of a show, it was called Victory and it had lots of like devised kind of, we devised like the movement in it together. Um, but I've been more part of it from the performer 
end of mm. it mostly and like the show I'm working on at the moment I'm just I'm like a former divisor in it so yeah um I, I kind of really I'm really interested in devising a, a just a one woman one woman show yeah a one performer show at some point what do you think it would be about the one performer show I'm quite I'm quite interested in at the moment I'm quite interested in like psychosomatic illnesses mm. in particular um which are kind of illnesses of where they're they're kind of meant to be predominantly in the mind so like um I was just I read a book about them and um for example there was this woman uh, this is kind of an example of a psychosomatic illness and she kind of um sprayed herself in the eye with like this a cleaning thing and she went blind but there was nothing wrong with her eyes but she'd kind of been so stressed when this had happened that she actually was she actually completely felt like she was blind even though her eyes were completely fine so I think I'm quite interested in the ways in which the mind and the body are like much more interlinked than we think they are and the like kind of the power of belief um so I'm quite interested in that at the moment I've been writing a bit about that but it, nothing like <laughs> Grand. I guess what do you wish you'd known before you ever started devising? What's something you wish you'd known going in about how to approach it, about what works well and what doesn't? I think one of the things that my my acting tutor at um, Central used to say, which I think applies really, really well to devising, is hold on tightly, let go lightly which is kind of like, you can't be precious about your ideas because you know, you've got to be willing to like let them go in the name of like the process. And yeah, you can't kind of grow overly attached to one idea. Um, but then you also, I think the flip side of that is like hold on tightly. You've got to see the idea through. You've got to like at least put it on its feet, work it out. I would say like every, most, pretty much every idea in the rehearsal, you should just try out. You should at least give it some space to breathe and try and understand it before anyone shoots it down or criticizes it. Um, but yeah, so like, don't be personal about your ideas. I think be able to kind of throw something out there and, and let it go if it's not what people think is exciting or interesting. Mm. No, completely. It's, it's so important as well to have like a space where everyone feels like they can throw those ideas out there and that you know, that they aren't going to be shot down by other people. Like everyone collaboratively makes that kind of acceptance that not everything works and that that's not a personal thing. Um, how do you think you go about establishing a space like that, a space where everyone feels comfortable expressing those ideas? Um, it, I mean, it is quite social, isn't it? I, th I think in some ways, like devising, I do think the casting process has to be it just, it can't be just like, who's the best performer ever? Because it's not really about that. It is about like, who is a team, who are team players and who are willing to share something and who is, yeah, like has respect for another person's creativity. Yeah, so like has their own creativity, but has respect for other people's creativities and other people's kind of visions and stuff. So I think a lot of it in some ways is in, is in your like casting process is in finding a group that really works together. And then also, I guess we did like, when, when I did like over Tesco carve up, we did so many sort of games together, especially at the beginning, which is just like very important, as you know, like in any rehearsal process to bond all your participants. Um, yeah, and I think having people in the group, having different personalities in the group can be really important like it's really I think there's it's always important to have maybe one person in the group who is quite critical and who is quite kind of looks at things and goes what's is this really going to work or what 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 is this doing is this really necessary and then also to have someone in the group who's just like throwing out ideas or kind of kind of energy and stuff so I think it's like you have important to have a kind of balance of personalities but that's obviously quite um that's quite tricky to get but it is about finding the right people and then kind of sticking with that would you say then when you were trying to audition people you'd always want to try and do a workshop audition or something before you cast people where you could kind of see those dynamics and I guess how how would you go about 
trying to like judge those like dynamics in a workshop audition or something like that because I think it's so hard to tell when people first meet what they're going to be like when they're comfortable together. So true. I have, I mean, I find workshop auditions like, as an actor, I find them, yeah, I find, <laughs> I find them quite a tricky thing because they're often very intimidating environments mm. in which people are really performative. So it's, and, but as a kind of, um, as a director, I'm, I kind of often look at them and think, oh, that's definitely the solution in a way of seeing people's creativity and stuff. So I think, I think it is about, I think having a conversation, I think having a kind of conversation or interview part of your um, audition process is quite important because then you can just see what they're like to talk to and kind of what ideas they might have or kind of what they have to offer up on a less intimidating atmosphere. Um, and then I think, yeah, I think a workshop um, audition can be really good. It's just maybe not making them too huge. I think the ones when they're like 30 people in a room, it can just tend to be like the, the it's not the cream that rises to the top, it's like the loudest. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and then also, yeah, so maybe having a smaller workshop and then, um, yeah, finding the kind of right activities that can make people feel less self-conscious and inhibited and you might begin to see more part of their personalities. Um, but yeah, I think not just, yeah, just not just giving someone a script and seeing how they read it and being like, that was really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think that's actually so right because obviously so, so many actors are actually very shy people sometimes and it is intimidating when, when either you're just walking into an audition room and you, you're given a script um, and it's like, now perform. <laughs> and, um, the same with doing a workshop audition it does like you say feel like sometimes a competition where the loudest and I think definitely with devising in a rehearsal room and with auditioning for it one of the biggest things is you have to take the tension out of the room don't you definitely and definitely fear out I, I really like yeah the idea of interviewing people first getting to know them and getting to know what they're like because it is such an important part of collaborating on a project and um, what would you say would be like the kind of games or workshopping activities that you'd always want to make part of the process for when you are trying to create that, that part where you're really easy and able to express everything and try everything? Um, what would you say are the things you would use both to, yeah, put people at ease and to start coming up with some really cool ideas for the show? Oh, so I probably do... I'm trying to think of like, I think you need to have one game that's really fun. I think you need to have like, especially after like sort of Friday after lunch, you need a game that's really fun. So people remember that they don't just want to have a nap, but they want to, <laughs> they want to <laughs> go and stuff. Um, so I personally find, I don't know what the name of it is, but like the one where you, um, you're all in a circle. Oh my God, I don't know how to describe this, but you're all in like a circle and you start off, maybe, you know, it's called like, I think it's called like patterns or something. Um, and you like build, you like start a sequence and um, where you each sort of pass like a number um, to each other. And then you like add a different thing and then you have like numerous patterns going or you can do it with a ball. Or you like throwing a ball and you have to do it in like the same order. Um, and then you throw in, you can do it, yeah, you could do it like multiple balls and you have to kind of throw in another ball, a different sequence, and then you have to have them all going at the same time. I also, I like, in one devising process, we played like lots of um, mafia, which I found quite good actually. <laughs> so it's the one where um, kind of people get sort of killed during the night and then you have to try and guess who, it's basically a poker face kind of game. You have to guess who the killer is. So we, yeah, so we used to play a lot of mafia, which was, I think was quite fun because it was quite, it's, it's actually quite good at um, getting some level of focus. Mm. Um, but then also I think Viewpoint is really good at, I mean, Viewpoint is not a game, um, but Viewpoint, are the kind of really basic kind of Viewpoints where you say, okay, to your performance, you can only, you can only crouch, hop or step and you've only got this grid of lines like either sideways or forwards and backwards to do it on and you have to be doing this and you have to be watching each other and sort of um be taking cues from what the person next to you is doing 
Um, I think that can be quite an interesting way of like, it's very loose. There's no rules, there's no way of winning it, but it's like quite a good way of developing awareness just with the performers in the room and kind of um, bringing some kind of, yeah, especially if like, especially if it's a bit chaotic in the room, it can be a really good way of just bringing some level of like peace and focus um, and listening, yeah. Mm. But what would you say when you start getting towards the point obviously where it's like, two, three weeks before a show and you're like, oh, we need to get structure. How do you go from the part of it where you're really kind of um, improvising and playing with it and just getting everyone comfortable to the part where you start structuring it into a show? How do you tend to get there? I think you need to think about form in quite like a hardcore way. <laughs> for, for a day or two, I think you need to be really thinking about what form you want the show to be I mean ideally you kind of want to think about form quite early on but I think that can I guess form is structure I suppose but um I can't remember who it was but some writer was talking about how she thinks about form as like a, a vessel a kind of a solid like but like a cup or something and she thinks of the content as like the liquid within that and so you think about the right sort of cup to hold your show um, uh, she, I don't know, she explained it really well, but it was a really interesting idea, kind of about how you want your form and your content to be kind of melded, or maybe you want them to be deliberately really, really different. Mm -hmm. So you're going to do some kind of comedy show, but it's about grief or something. Um, so thinking about the ways in which those match up. But I think if you have like quite a clear idea of how you want your form to be, so maybe you want to do like for lights of tesco we knew we wanted it to be like a docu a documentary a comic documentary <laughs> um and so we could that allowed us to have a structure within which to slot our different ideas which was really helpful but i think having quite a clear idea of saying okay i want i want it to be a noir thriller this is what the form that's going to take um, and then maybe you could even change it. Maybe you could break the rules halfway through and it's like not a noir thriller anymore. It's, I don't know, a Chekhov play. But, <laughs> but like it, but ha I think thinking really creative, cre creatively about form and how you can use form allows you not to be suddenly like, oh, we've got this structure. We've got to like somehow put these in order mm -hmm. and it's a bit, it feels a bit rat like it you don't want there to be like a randomness to the way you've done your scenes they need to feel like they're developing and growing into some the end I think it's it really helps because it is it is the understanding I think a lot of people get intimidated by devising because it almost sounds like you're just going to do a show and then something will come out of nothing or it won't <laughs> so I think it is understanding how there is that that form that needs to be there and I think it's a really good way of explaining it as essentially saying it, it because it's devising, it's something you can change later if you want to. But by having it there, you're giving yourself a jumping off point. And yeah, I, totally. Definitely. Yeah, you're giving yourself the space to play with it. And that's such an important part of it. And for feeling calm and for everyone feeling like they know what they're doing and where this is going. Definitely. I think it's easier to be, it's always easier to be creative when you have like a, we're like to be creative in a box when you have a set of rules that you oh like you have a style and I'm not saying you don't you can you can still break it or whatever and you can do what you like but like to start off within the kind of rules really helps you to actually unlock your potential and unlock like kind of creative ideas you might not have thought about whereas like starting on a blank piece of paper is just obviously the hardest thing yeah um, well, I think it's the same as um, what people always say about not having resources is a really good thing for creativity because you have limits and it means yeah. you can like, mess with those and you can um, kind of play around with what they are but at the end of the day it, it makes you think creatively, it gives you parameters to work within. Definitely, yeah. limits, yeah, so true, so so true. And even I think sometimes even like making up false limits, mm. <laughs> like that um, can really help you. Like if you say like, at the beginning you said, I wanna have a scene that's a song. I wanna have a scene where everybody is, 
I don't know. I don't know. I want to have a scene where everyone's on the floor. I want to have it. You know what I mean? These kind of limits, like even those can really just help you to start to make a show that has kind of, um, kind of lots of variety and it's more theatrical. I think it's, it's part of the fun of actually something like devising is that you can go in and be like, I really want to do this, but I haven't quite figured out how yet but you now have a group of people you can work on that with. You can figure out how that looks and how that works. I think that that's a really fun part of the process. Yeah, yeah, it is. It should, I think it should be really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think definitely. I think also, how much do you think that what you take from devising can translate over to more scripted kind of theatre and how much do you think it kind of should? And yeah, what do you think are the things that almost people could take advice from devising on? Yeah, I think, um, I think devising could be really helpful for like a lot of young writers, a lot of young playwrights, because I think it can be, I think it can be really hard, like when you're just sitting at home um, writing stuff to kind of forget you have like a stage and you've got bodies and you've got actors and you've got lighting, you've got so many theatrical things at your fingertips that aren't just um, words. And I think, I think it would be, I think it would be really helpful to have more kind of devisers working with like writers um, to kind of step, to work out how to stage pieces. Because I think just cause I've seen, I've read quite, quite a lot of like student writing and I've seen like read lots of fantastic student writing but often I find like a consistent thing I find is like it's um uh how do I put this it's kind of like an over-reliance on words mm. and forgetting that you actually have you don't need always need to use words because you've got the whole of like the form of theatre to use to convey your ideas and I think having more of a kind of relationship between um, perform like writers developing their work with performers um, could really help that. Um, could really help writers have like more of an understanding of like the theatrical form and kind of how they can use it in all kinds of ways. I think completely the kind of it's not just this writer's play and if it all goes wrong it's all someone's fault and that it's it's kind of like everyone's worked on it everyone's got a stake in it and there isn't quite the same, um, there's almost quite the same kind of like ego investment, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it's sort of, um, I guess it's quite like anti-auteur. Mm. Is it? Is that correct? Well, I guess auteur is more director, isn't it? It's like the director, writer, kind of all <laughs> controller. But I think if you do have um, a quite a democratic devising process, where people have a good amount of creative say. Um, yeah, I think I think it is quite anti-auteur, which is quite interesting because I think the auteur is like super fashionable at the moment. Mm. Um, someone who has sort of like a bit of a, basically a bit of a puppet ma master mm. is kind of how I see an auteur. Um, but it, it doesn't mean like, I feel like auteurs often produce like super striking work with such a strong sense of like a voice and a tone and a style and I think that can be the one thing of the danger of devising is you think because you have so many different people in the room is it's like how do you create an overarching style or tone how does like it not get watered down um because you haven't got a single authorial voice um but I think with the right group you can create like a really specific collective authorial voice um i think i think maybe you have to be on the i think you have to have somewhat of like a similar taste i would say yeah i think i i guess part of this establishing the form quite early is almost establishing like a direction like a feeling you're heading towards or an idea even if it's not really that solid yet but at least having getting that sense quite early on and where everyone stands on that and how actually because like you say it's not a unified perspective it's individuals um how the trying to get a sense early on of how those perspectives would unify and how you can <laughs> yeah make something that comes out unified and yet <laughs> no true it's 
Yeah, that is really hard. I think that's probably the key to devising is like having that, to be honest, is, I mean, that sounds really sort of annoying thing to say, like the key to devising is like the right group of people. But I, and I don't think that's wholly true because I think you can like, you can definitely have quite diff different kind of tastes and, and develop something that's really good. But I think often if you do have like, um, at least some overlap. I think there needs to be some overlap in what you love. Then I think that's a lot easier to kind of all be excited about. Like when you do something and you all really like it, that's great because you know you will think it's good. It's more likely to actually be good. Um, think, yeah, yeah. I think that's it. You need like a unified language to talk about something. Oh, like you need to. You don't need to agree. You just need to know you can, can like communicate about it in a way that is productive. Definitely, yeah. I think, yeah, it's it's a, it's a tricky one. I think that's where, like, the you mentioning interviews before going in shows would actually work quite well. They were having an informal chat with someone to get mm. that sense of actually how they work and how they approach these kind of conversations. Definitely, I think I think fundamentally, you all have to. I think what it is is maybe you don't all have to have the exact same taste or whatever, or the same style of performing, or the same. It's good if you have different skills. <laughs> obviously, but I think you have to have respect for each other. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think if there's, but that's like in life, you have to have respect for the people that you work with, but definitely with devising, because you have to respect other people's ideas, because it is quite vulnerable, putting out an idea, can be quite vulnerable, especially if you really like the idea. Um, so there needs to be, there needs to be an environment of respect, and uh, yeah, the performers, and the devisers and the director, they all need to like respect each other um, and their taste somewhat, yeah. And yeah, and just, I think um, it it's, goes across kind of all kind of fear to making that though, is that you need to be able to respect each other's time and each other's involvement. And you don't, you don't want to be part of a team where other people are kind of, don't have respect for the other people with, with roles in the show. I think it's it's something that is really good to take out of things like devising because I think you have to if you've devised a show you have to do have learned that eventually and yeah. so taking that out and applying it to theatre more widely is definitely yeah I, I would say very important. I think you're absolutely right and more and more as I yeah more and more I just feel like it's so important to I don't know like I was just I, I kind of talked to you briefly about this but I was working on this film set and I was just it kind of made me think as like as a sort of like dog's body a very short film set I was, and it just made me think about how important it is um for like um people in kind of positions of power in these like creative work environments to kind of say hello to people who are on the lower rungs and introduce them to other people um, and make everyone kind of feel at home because it doesn't take very much, but it's like so important. It's so important. And um, I think I was just talking to my friend about this because she's an assistant to, to a producer. Um, and she was just talking about going to meetings and sort of like social, this before pandemic, but like sort of social sort of canopy networking events with her boss and just feeling quite invisible in the room because the important people only wanted to talk to the other important people and I just thought it just really doesn't cost much and I think it's so important that um, there's recognition of everyone every cog in the machine and yeah just respect because like it just means like that you just don't feel dignified in those roles when those roles are completely dignified you know um, but yeah it's it's also valuing that like nothing would happen without those roles and making people feel valued it's so important yeah i just think it just doesn't cost much to be like this is Bali bar they're my assistant they've done loads of work on this project mm -hmm. because i think yeah it just means that it means it means the world like definitely when you're doing those kind of positions and then don't feel super rewarding but you have to do them as you say you have to like start at the bottom but it just feels like you just feel seen and yeah just respected yeah yeah it makes absolutely all the difference to the world to the people like it affects 
and in like any production on any scale it will make a huge difference to people if you treat them with respect and value them I, the thing i think the thing i find a bit depressing is i think there is so like i think in terms of the kind of work environments that we're probably both working in in terms of like when we're creating theater and stuff there's loads of respect among like emerging people among kind of fringe theater makers among kind of yeah young theater makers but i think it's when you get to like the big commercial you know when as soon as there's like money involved basically because we're not in like a hugely big money driven things but as soon as there seems to be money involved it seems to be like that respect um it just seems to drop off and unless you're kind of like the most important person in the room you're not you're just like not treated well okay. so yeah it, I, it's tricky because i feel like in some ways i feel i think like loads of people in terms of our peers and are talking about this stuff but it feels like the people at the top still aren't i think it is i think you're right it's it's the money as well i think it's when you get to that point where there's a creative ownership issue and there's something that's worth so much that you actually want to debate who creatively owns this. I think that's very true. I think like capitalism like wants to find like individuals and say you are the money maker here you're the one that's like the reason why the show was so successful and so we're going to give you another show um, rather than kind of seeing it as like oh wait this whole this whole like microcosm that made the show was clearly really good, it clearly really worked. <laughs> we all just want to sort of like pin down certain individuals and say like, oh, those are the people that are the geniuses. I think we're just like quite fascinated by this idea of like the genius. Um, and so we kind of, yeah, give too much credit to like the individual and not enough to the team. On a slightly lighter note, um, <laughs> I feel I should steer us back towards devising again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but what would you say is the funniest experience you've had in the rehearsal room devising? Um, oh, the funniest thing. Oh, I, I, we have this bit in the show in like Tesco. And I think it came about because we were eating like, we were eating brownies one day in rehearsal and then we were very, very, being very, very silly. And I think I was joking about there being like poo in the brownies. And then anyway, we made this scene, which is like the poo in the, we made the scene where I give some audience members brownies and then I'm like, oh, there's poo in them afterwards. <laughs> and um, it was a real like, it didn't work every night, that scene at all. Like <laughs> sometimes people would, it was a really good barometer of like how mature the audience was. <laughs> um, they were, like, <laughs> because sometimes like people would be cackling and then, Sometimes it was just like um, crickets. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that was like, that was r really, that was really silly. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we had this, we also had a little bit in the show because that was a bit of a like a funny, always a bit of a funny moment. We always had a bit in the show after, like the scene after that, we'd always go like, should we include that? Should we keep that bit? to the audience like about that scene um which was yeah quite funny yeah they're just very fun environments and very kind of quite quite giggly and quite silly especially if you're making something obviously you're making something comic i, I don't i've never to be honest i've never been in devising room where we've been making something that's um like got a really serious tone or the content matters like very um like sad or kind of dark or serious or something so I don't know what that would be like and I, I I'm probably not very good to advise on how to make that like a safe space and a um a comfortable space but yeah because all the stuff I've been doing has been quite kind of comic but yeah though yeah <laughs> I, I think I think what you say about kind of judging the audience on the night and um, being able to do that and being able to kind of go okay this doesn't work when you're actually performing a show just actually go this doesn't work it's like one of the real advantages of devising is it because there isn't this script that has to stay um and it's kind of a fixed point it's like you can be like that joke's not funny we should cut it or like this audience is not going to laugh at this joke because they really didn't like the other one the other one like five minutes ago okay cool we just tonight we won't say it yeah 
Yeah, it's but it's also like a bit of a mind, like a bit of a mind fuck devising because you will you will do like you'll be talking to people afterwards and some people absolutely love one scene and some people will be like, oh, I really didn't understand that or I really didn't really didn't like that scene. Um so it's kind of it's quite hard to yeah, it's quite hard to kind of know exactly you can't like exactly like follow what audience says. I think you can kind of follow what, what the majority say, I suppose. But you do have to kind of go with your gut um, and go with your own taste, I suppose. Um, but yeah, like with Lights Over Tesco, it was quite interesting. I think because we had so much audience participation in it, um, it was quite interesting because you we were very like, in no other show I've been so aware of how the audience are feeling and how they're receiving the show. And sometimes it would be like absolutely raucous and you could tell like they were having a great, like you could always tell what kind of time they were having. But sometimes the show would be going fantastically well. And then I remember another night, I remember we had a, another day w which where we like saw like three people leave the show halfway through and we're like, whoa. Um, but you just have to like, I think that's just like, that's the brutality of the fringe, isn't it? Mm. Um, but like, I think cause it is a show that asks a lot of its audiences cause it, cause it, can potentially like abduct you that like it's really not for everyone which is fair and it kind of yeah it's not just sort of sit back and eat your Maltesers and enjoy it was sort of more a little bit more in your face than that but um but that was I think it's quite great to, it's quite great as a performer to be able to develop to do a show where you have lots of audience participation because I think it makes you a lot stronger um, because it, it make, one makes you quite resilient because you have to keep going even if you think like they're not having the best time ever. And two, it makes you like a really good listener because um, it makes you kind of be kind of spontaneous with how like, the, if like say you've abducted someone from the audience and you could tell they're a bit shy, like it makes you kind of understand how you might facilitate that person on stage and how you might not, you might kind of slightly uh, change your normal routine with them to, to be slightly less asking a little bit less of them like or maybe hand holding a little bit more kind of telling them a little bit more obviously what they need to do um, so I think those things are really good because they make it mean it's quite hard it makes you have to be quite comfortable on stage so I would say it's a, a, a good learning experience um, yeah I suppose it's yeah you have to be ready in that in like in the moment for practically anything to happen and sort of just be okay with the fact that it might not go down the same way every night and I think obviously that's part of the joy of it is that you're gonna have a different show every night which is so different to so many like, oh, yeah. and so much fun but yeah terrifying as well um really terrifying yeah <laughs> yeah I think it makes you it makes you adaptable it makes you up for changing things um, so it it's, it's obviously it's like it's quite similar in that way to improv um, but how different would you say the experience of devising a show and improvising is if that makes sense um no that definitely makes sense I think improv is really really useful but I don't think I think you can rely on it too much and it's I think improv is quite hard um so I have a few things to say I wanted to say about improv um which were yeah so I think improv is really useful and I actually think this is true of just acting um of like doing acting like etudes but I'll talk about it in a second but improv is really useful when you have like constraints where you have limits on it so I think when you give a bunch of performers like uh, improvisation and you kind of clearly say either you clearly really clearly lay out the circumstances and you say like it's 4 57 p.m you're you want this from this character you want this from this character you're here like um your relationship is this and you really like you could lay out the circumstances really kind of in a really detailed way or you could do something where you you know talk about like like we were talking about limits like we I want you to try and do it in this style I want you to only shout in the scene and I want you and I want the other person to say absolutely nothing. So, you, but I think when you just say improv to the, when you just say to the actors like improvise and you sort of give them just one really loose idea, it can just end up 
being people can get quite inhibited and quite self-conscious and like then you end up with something that's a bit long and a bit rambling and maybe not that useful and um, so yeah I think improvisation is really great when you have rules or you have really strong imaginary circumstances which is how if you were doing like an acting study for a character and you wanted to know how they moved how you might want to similarly use improvisation but I would say you cannot rely on improvisation. You need to be think. You need to be thinking about research. You need to be like sitting down and thinking about the show and talking about like interesting scenes. And I think planning interesting scenes together and then trying them out. Or you need to be playing like different kinds of games. Um, or yeah. So I just don't think I think too much reliance on improvisation can mean can actually be like quite uninspiring and also places like so much impetus on just the performer devices to like find something good in a scene um yeah i don't think i i think working out a whole show through just improvisation would be like so hard i think you've got to be thinking about form and you've got to be going back to your research um yeah i, th I think that's the thing that people i guess don't always think about with devising and talk about is that actually there is so much research that leads into it. And obviously this varies production to production. Um, but how much would you say that the productions you've been involved with, and I guess the productions that you'd want to create would be led by research, would be like um, doing research before, would be doing research kind of during? And yeah, how much would you say it kind of leads the production or is like, or does the kind of production lead the research? I think research should lead the production in my opinion but like I think that's how I work and I find research quite inspiring and gives you a stimulus and like you can bring in a bit of text from your research and go like I want to read I want to read this all together and then try and make something from this text make something inspired by this text so it gives you kind of starting place a place to like bound off of um I think I mean, it's a little bit like writing an essay, I suppose. I think it's important to do research, but I think it's also important not to do too much research. Because mm. um, then I think you can, you can arrive in the rehearsal room and you've got so many ideas and you've got so much stuff. You're trying to like whack it all into the show and it ends up being like just too much stuff, too many ideas. Um, so I would, say, I would say do research before and then like, put it to bed, start creating, and then try and make sure you're returning to it and using it as stimulus and thinking about it throughout the process, but have days where you're not, and days where you're just being really playful, and then days when maybe you're, ret you're returning quite intensively to the things that you've looked at. Um, I, yeah, because I think it can, you can do loads of research and then you can start playing the rehearsal room and forget your research completely, <laughs> um, and kind of, forget all the cool ideas that you've come across. So it's really important to return to it. And I also think that it's kind of quite productive to delegate. I mean, this is what Katie Mitchell does where she like delegates research in her rehearsal room. So she'll say to one actor, like, I want you to research really intensively the period that the play is set in. And I want you to research like the politics of the time and I want you to research that. And so everyone becomes like a little expert on that area. Um, and I think that can be such a great way of doing because then people keep on, they kind of feel a sense of pride in their little kind of faculty and they're kind of fe feeding those ideas back in um, and people are bringing different things to the table. Definitely making people independent researchers, making the performers feel like there's an independent impetus for them to go off and research will make them more invested in the show and um yeah we'll make it more disciplined and will make people put more effort in i think it definitely comes back to a lot of the stuff we've said about um both having kind of form having a form to work with i mean if you're improvising having a world to improvise in with research with making people independent researchers it is it's it's part of this whole thing of making people feel like they can contribute their ideas to the room safely. I think coming at it from a point where everyone from the start has been given a job to do, and then they've all got this expertise that they can come at the show with. I think that's a really nice way to actually make people feel that way, make people feel like they're valuable and at ease and have something to say, because I think um, a lot of people, yeah, do get intimidated by the fact that you might 
walk into a devising room and maybe everyone else is going to be like a comic genius and you're going to be <laughs> just like standing there like oh no <laughs> so yeah I, yeah it's true I think I think that's so true like if if say if maybe you don't have like loads of creative ideas but you're like a, you're like a good researcher and you're good at kind of synthesizing large amounts of information that's such a useful skill so yeah totally it can like equip yeah it can equip performers with the sense of like confidence and that they can give something to a room yeah it was, it, yeah it just it validates them a bit as well because I think a lot of people people have varying levels of obviously comfortable giving their ideas um, and have very varying levels of confidence in how good their ideas are and if you actually know that something is um, well researched and you know your stuff on it it might be just a thing that gives you the confidence to start giving ideas yeah definitely I think that's so true yeah I'm I'm definitely someone who feels like much more comfortable and confident when I have like some stuff written down when I come into a rehearsal room um yeah I think that's really important but yeah I also would say as well like you also don't want to read too much I think if you're reading like whole books and books for a show it's perhaps you're reading a little bit too much because can only you like your show is probably only going to be like I don't know maximum two hours mm. so and you, you don't want to be trying to hold all that in your head at the same time as trying to act in a show it's exactly. like you, you can't play out five books at once <laughs> Yeah, and your show is not meant to be a book. Like, you definitely don't want a devising show to become a PowerPoint presentation or SparkNotes version of some of the books you've done. <laughs> you've read for it. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a really tricky balance between, like, using your, imp using your research, um, but, like, making sure, like, you're, you're using it in, like, a really theatrical way and how, how you're doing it so it doesn't just feel, yeah, like a presentation. I, th I think it's 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 what you said before. It is the holding on tightly, letting go lightly. It always comes back to that because it is just like it's important, but no when to like just let go of it. Exactly, and then also it will. I think on the day, like I said before, like on the, those days where I think you shouldn't be thinking about your research, you should just be like playing. And I think if you've done enough research, it will be infusing how you're thinking about stuff, and you might do a scene. And it's nothing to do with your research. And then you might sit down and think about it and go like, oh, that is actually quite interesting because I could use it, could use that scene in a completely different way. I'd use like this breakup scene that we made. We could use it and actually like each per per person stands for like a country. You could like think about ways in which you can use what you've created that feels quite different from your research and tie up to your research um, in creative ways. So I think... Yeah, definitely having days where you completely just play is really important. It's almost just forgetting that you've done the research, but still having the research there in your head, because it just means your brain will make those connections that it wouldn't have otherwise. A hundred percent, yeah. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to ask, I guess, would be how important would you say it is that when you were working on a devising show, um, that you have audience workshops before that you get some friends into the rehearsal room to come and see it before or you get like yeah like a friendly audience to come and see the first version or go to scratch nights all of that how important would you say that is to the process or how much would you say that it sometimes can scare you <laughs> more than is actually helpful i think that's absolutely like so important so important to to do it to friends to so we did so yeah, so for the show I'm working on right now, we did like a work in progress show, um, which was an hour long. And I think it was really helpful because we heard, we got lots of feedback. But in some ways I think it was quite polished because we had the lighting, we had the, the set and we had, you know, costumes and it was kind of almost an hour long. And I think it's quite, it's quite useful to do a scratch night because it's, even though I know that's a work in progress show, I think it didn't, because it started to feel quite like a finished article, um, I'm like, I was, I started to not think about it as like a work in progress and started not to think about how to, how we can develop it. Whereas I think if you put it in a scratch night, then you're very aware that it's like this scrappy thing and then you're only gonna do a little bit of it. And 
you feel very free to change it and stuff. So almost like not, I think having like several iterations of it where it really shouldn't feel polished yet. I think it's really important. Like not, I think almost jumping to the light, lighting kind of stage too early um, can stop you maybe from like developing and thinking about the show in a really, really elastic way of like I could completely change all of this because as soon as you start to light it and you start to put it in costumes and start, you start to think of like oh this is the show mm. um but yeah I think having like rehearsals where you get in friends is so important because I think often you think things make sense and largely the problems with the show is not usually that they're bad or really good it's usually just like that really made sense that really didn't make sense like those are especially the usefulest notes most useful notes because you're often not aware of that yourself. Um, so yeah, so making sure, or if you, or maybe that you deliberately don't want it to make sense in some point, but like <laughs> the clarity of the show and the clarity of your storytelling um, can only really be revealed by, by an audience member telling you what they saw afterwards. So I think getting friends in, doing scratch nights, doing the show, and then sitting down afterwards and going, we can change anything about that. Mm. That's the key. It, it should just be like evolving and adapting because I think it, it, it takes, devising takes longer, in my opinion. It, it takes longer, but then it can be like more rewarding. You want to you feel like you, like you said, it's, it's important to have the limits, but you also don't want to put restrictions on yourself too soon. You don't want to start panic fixing stuff in place, you know? That's what I mean is in the show I'm working on, which I, I'm sure we, we're gonna go back and like redevelop it and stuff. But I think because we had a sense of like, we had to put this on as a show, there was like fixes to bits that, we, you know, that weren't working rather than like sort of quick fixes to elements of the show rather than actually just deeply thinking like, oh, how can we change it in like quite a deep way to make this work? Like, how can we make this work? Um, rather than how can we not embarrass ourselves next week. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. But, no, I'm really, really excited to go back and develop the show. I think it's really exciting. I think there was lots of it that was really, really worked. But, um, but yeah, I think thinking I did, we just need to work on how it all kind of ties together. Because the timer has gone off, um, we're going to do one quick last question. Uh, which is the kind of the the whole focus of the series, the whole point of the series is is this question. It's the what do you wish you had known before you had started devising, and what do you wish you could tell someone who's thinking about trying it now? Cool. So <laughs> the things I would say are um, research your topic definitely put in the research and the discipline because, and even if you don't like it, then you discover, okay, research is not really my thing. That doesn't help me. Um, but give it a go because it will give you at least some bedrock and some confidence to start your devising process on. Um, it's okay to copy other people. It's okay <laughs> to be a copycat when you start because um, like it's only through like aiming to be a bit like your idols that you're gonna even start to kind of find your own voice. So it's okay to kind of really, really copy something else. I think that's fine. I think, I, I think a lot of people really, I was really scared of like being like someone else's style and like, but I think, especially when you're just starting out, embrace that, embrace your love of like other, other theater and your, the directors you love and stuff. It's definitely okay for it, your work to be a bit like theirs when you start. Um, and then, yeah, hold on tightly, let go lightly. I think that's really important in the devising process. Um, don't take things too personally. Just try and throw out ideas, like try not to be too precious about ideas, but also, yeah, let them live for their moment. Let them have their, let them have their moment in the spotlight. Um, but then <laughs> let go lightly if they don't really work. And um, yeah, so try everything out. So try everyone's ideas out. So if someone in the rehearsal room says an idea and you're like, really not sure about that idea, that's a bit bonkers. You should just, you should give it, give it a go. Try and think about it from different angles. Like, oh, could this be cool this way? Put it on its feet. And then if it still doesn't work, 
let it go. But I think you have to have respect as we're talking about other people's ideas. And um, yeah, make sure, I think my, my last thing would be like, uh, make sure you're not talking all the right time in rehearsal, obviously about ideas and make sure you're not just like talking the whole day away, but also I think talking is really important. So you need to strike the balance between maybe half the time you're being on your feet, half the time you're talking about stuff and working it out or writing, you're know, doing writing exercises together. Oh, thank you so much. It's been so, so lovely to interview you. And um, yeah, this is going to be part of a whole series. So if someone is watching this and they're interested in learning more about emerging theatre makers and hearing people's perspectives from doing different kinds of theatre, please keep up to date with our YouTube channel, subscribe, like, follow our social media pages and keep an eye out because there'll be more. <laughs>